Good afternoon. On behalf of Bob Bauer and myself, the co-directors of NYU Law School's Legislative and Regulatory Process Clinic, a clinic designed to provide third-year law students with hands-on experience how government lawyers affect the development and implementation of public policy, I want to welcome you to the fifth year of the Sidley Austin Forum. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our Dean and staunch supporter of our program, Trevor Morrison. Trevor. Thank you, Sally. Welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us for this exciting event uh, entitled Making Progress Amidst Polarization. Um, we are thrilled to be welcoming uh, Senator Klobuchar as our keynote speaker today. Senator, thank you so much for joining us. I'm also really grateful to our panelists uh, Sarah Binder and Paul Kane, and we hope Yamish Alcinder, who has um, some travel challenges today, but we're hoping she will be able to join us. Our colleague Bob Bauer will be moderating that panel discussion. I want to thank Bob and Sally, uh, not only for their tremendous leadership of our legislative and regulatory process clinic, um, but also for organizing today's event. Thanks also to our colleague Sue Anderson for her great work helping to organize the event. And my final thanks uh, go to our friends at Sidley Austin. Their wonderful support uh, it makes it possible for us to put on this event every year, and we're really grateful for that. Um, and speaking of Sidley, I hope you'll all join me in welcoming John Custer, a graduate of NYU Law from the class of 1991 and a partner at Sidley. I'll turn things over to John. John. Thank you, Dean Morrison. Uh, Sidley is proud to support the fifth annual NYU Sidley Austin Forum on Making Progress Amidst Polarization. Today's forum, like the others before it, is a way in which all of us can learn something about a topic that is in the forefront of political reality that affects the legislative and regulatory process in the United States. And like the others before it, today's forum promises to deliver a terrific program about the topic it addresses, how to make progress in light of the political polarization that is reality today in Washington and many state houses across the country. Uh, who better to help us explore this important topic than our keynote speaker, uh, Senator Klobuchar, who, who's very job it is to try and make progress amidst polarization in the United States, Senator, uh, United States Senate. We also wish to thank in advance the terrific and distinguished panelists who will also give us their keen insights into how today's Congress might find a way forward through what to many seems to be a dense fog of heightened partisanship. Without them, the forum could not be a success. We also are very grateful for the hard work of both uh, Sally Katzen and Bob Bauer in putting today's forum together. They have once again done an, an outstanding job. In addition, we are grateful to Dean Morrison for his continued support and vision for the Sidley and NYU Legislative and Regulatory Process Clinic Forum so that we could combine our efforts to make this forum a vital part of the dialogue on topics central to understanding how our government and democracy works. Sidley also has a wonderful relationship with NYU. As Sally, as uh, Dean uh, uh, Morrison mentioned, I'm an alumnus of NYU. So are nearly 100 lawyers at Sidley, firm-wide, including over 35 partners. We are proud to partner with NYU Law on this innovative forum. And we know that our two institutions can make a valuable contribution to the dialogue involving American democracy, citizen engagement, and public service. Uh, this forum is an example of Sidley uh, and our continued commitment uh, to that progress, and we are proud to be part of this forum. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Sally to uh, kick it off for us. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, as Bob and I were considering topics for this year's forum, we were looking for something that would be both timely and thought-provoking, and we, we settled on increased polarization in Washington and particularly on Capitol Hill. That led us immediately to Senator Amy Klobuchar, whose efforts on developing bipartisan relationships and passing bipartisan bills is outstanding, one of the best records in the Senate by far. We were delighted when she agreed to be our keynote speaker. Senator Klobuchar has served as a Minnesota Senator since 2007. She serves on the Judiciary Committee, including being chair of the Subcommittee on Competitive Policy, Antitrust and Consumer Rights. <clears throat> 
and she's on the Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry Committee and the Commerce and Joint Economic Committees. She's also co-chair of the Senate Broadband Caucus. Her list of accomplishments would fill a whole page of very tiny type. In 2019, Vanderbilt University, after an exhaustive study, ranked her the most effective Democratic Senator in the 115th Congress. Reflecting her leadership in the Senate and the respect of her colleagues, she was chosen as the co-chair of the inaugural committee this past January and as chairwoman of the Rules Committee, an extraordinarily important and prestigious position. She was front and center on the Senate floor during the events of January 6th. She is one of the most thoughtful, dynamic, pragmatic, and inspiring senators and a personal heroine of mine. It is a great privilege that I give you Senator Amy Klobuchar. Wow, well, thank you so much, uh, Sally. We don't usually hear that around this place. Um, and I really appreciate the nice, warm introduction um, and the leadership all of you have shown. I wanna thank Sidley Austin and the NYU School of Law uh, for making today's event possible. Um, you know, not a, a minimal topic, making progress amidst polarization. What polarization? Okay, now that is not the topic of my talk. Uh, I also wanna thank Bob Bauer for moderating today's event. Uh, he is a legal powerhouse uh, who has advised party leaders and presidents alike. Uh, he's also a professor of practice and distinguished scholar in resident at NYU. And I got to work with him in the run up to the counting of electoral ballots on January 6th, uh, which is probably a really good place to start. Um, I know Yamish is going to try to be on an extraordinary a reporter uh, with PBS, Sarah Binder, thank you, and then Paul Kane, who actually was firsthand, if I'm remembering this right, yes, uh, initially in the room uh, with the other senators uh, when we were uh, put into a shelter in place situation, so it was a pretty good person uh, to have uh, with you. So that's where I'm going to begin, when the angry violent mob staged an insurrection on January 6th and desecrated our capital, the temple of our democracy. It wasn't just an attack on the building, it was an attack on our Republic. And I will never forget at the end of that day, after as Paul remembers, uh, we had all uh, committed to going back there no matter what. And I want a picture for those of you who may work at a, anywhere, nonprofit business, uh, that if you had had terrorists invade your conference room, say, uh, most people wouldn't be like, well, I'm going to go back there tonight. That's what we had to do because it was so important to our democracy. And so at the end of it all at 3.30 a.m., it was simply uh, my friend, Senator Blunt, uh, who at the time was a chair because Georgia had just been the night before, uh, and Vice President Pence, uh, alongside two young women, two young pages who carried those mahogany boxes holding the final state's electoral votes. And we walked literally over broken glass from the Senate to the House to finish our job and to say to not just the people in our country, but, but to the world that democracy would prevail. And then two weeks later, after, by the way, a lot of people saying, um, you know, the inauguration should be inside. Oh, you should do it in a bunker. It's the safest thing. Uh, not just then President-elect Biden felt strongly that that shouldn't happen, um, but Roy and I felt strongly that we needed to retake that place. And of course we listened to security, but we had so much pushback from even my own newspaper's editorial page uh, uh, that we shouldn't be doing that. But we believed uh, that our security would be there. And we also believed that that stage was exactly where the insurrectionists had attacked. They had literally spray painted the bottoms of the pillars and at, no one much talked about it, but you could still see the remnants of the spray paint during the inauguration. Uh, we had makeshift windows behind us. And as I said, from the inaugural stage on that beautiful blue sky day at the very place where the insurrection had happened, that this is a day where our democracy picks itself up, brushes off the dust and does what America always does, goes forward as a nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. 
it was this amazing day, except for when I realized Lady Gaga and I were wearing the same dress. Okay, that, that didn't really happen. Um, but it was the culmination of 244 years of democracy. And I remember telling the story of how Abraham Lincoln, you know, at the height of the Civil War was asked why he was spending money on building that capital and um, getting that project done. And he said, it matters. I'm paraphrasing Abraham Lincoln now, but it matters um, that we have a citadel of democracy, uh, that we show the people that our democracy goes on. And so that's my story of how President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris became, as we all should strive to be, the guardians of our country. But we also have the issue of what led us to that moment. And that is the pinnacle of polarization, false lies on the internet, false claims from the former president that the election was stolen, an angry mob that was encouraged to march right down that mall to the Capitol. So earlier um, this month, um, Senator Roy Blunt and uh, Senator Portman and Gary Peters and I uh, led a bipartisan report to look at what happened. Now, I believe we need a line 11 style commission and investigation, I made that clear by Cameron working across um, uh, many agency lines to really get to the bottom and put in one place uh, everything that happened and what the recommendations are and looking at the rise of white supremacism and the like. But we felt it was important to do our part to get some immediate recommendations out about capital security. And that was progress. But I think we all know that political polarization in Congress is making it harder for us to do the rest of what needs to be done to get to the truth and protect our democracy, which includes a 9-11 style report. Yet we have members of Congress who are so opposed to finding the truth about the insurrections that they literally ostracized Liz Cheney um, for simply being honest about what happened on January 6th. Partisanship is also stopping us um, from work on voting rights. It used to be, this was always bipartisan. The Voting Rights Act was bipartisan. Um, so much of the work we've done in this area has been bipartisan. Uh, but in fact, we've seen just this year, 22 voter suppression bills that have been signed into law, over 300 of them introduced. And we still see, and here's what's interesting, uh, we still see the overwhelming majority of Americans have made it clear they wanna see policies that make it easier to vote. And yet many, we had an election where the biggest turnout ever in the middle of a pandemic and they elected someone who rejected the polarization. They elected Joe Biden, someone who stood and really boldly stood up for this proposition that he was gonna represent everyone in the country whether they voted for him or not. I'll never uh, forget him saying that uh, when he was declared uh, the winner of this election. So why are we where we are? Well, I think Senator Warnock in his maiden speech, I got to be there for it and it was this incredible moment. And he said uh, probably more clearly and succinctly than all the words I'll say today. Uh, he said, some people don't want some people to vote. This isn't a manufactured crisis. It's a real crisis when states purges the names of longtime voters from their uh, voter rolls so they can't cast a ballot in places like Georgia, or when voters in Wisconsin are forced to stand in line in the rain wearing garbage bags and homemade masks during a pandemic just to vote. And that angry mob at the Capitol, that was to me just the ultimate representation of this. So my topic today, how do we move our country forward in the face of this radioactive politics? And how do we make progress with that kind of polarization and hate? So I'm gonna step back a little, you know, I have all kinds of policy prescriptions for this, everything from uh, better regulation of the tech companies. Well, you can read my book about it, but doing something about antitrust and monopolies, which are finally moving on, um, doing something um, to uh, take on this hate, not just uh, in our country, but on the international stage. But when I go back to your real question at hand, uh, which is really how do we get this done? I actually go back when I think about what's stopping us from doing stuff outside of antiquated laws, which I'll get to in a minute, all kinds of things. Um, I always think about these things with these four quadrants of decision-making. And this was actually something um, that Chuck Schumer um, told me 
um, that his mentor, assembly member, uh, Anthony Genovese used. So I always thought, okay, this is cool, check came up. But then I found out uh, that Stephen Covey um, actually developed this. Um, and then I found out it was actually President Eisenhower. So who knows? But it's looking at decision-making in four quadrants. And at the top of a square box is the word important, right? Just picture like four quadrants. So at the top is important on one side and then unimportant on the bottom two. And then at the top of the whole box, you've got urgent and not urgent. So you kind of put these things into four quadrants. So you have things like important and urgent. Well, we all know that's where government has to act. That's things like a gas leak, a pipe burst, a blizzard during a presidential campaign announcement. Okay, no, not really. But it is things where government has to respond to crises. And by the way, we often do that pretty well. But we'll get to the next part is why did it get to the crisis? So in my first year in the Senate, when the 35W bridge in Minneapolis collapsed, taking the lives of 13, and as I said that day, a bridge just doesn't fall down in the middle of America, we immediately worked across the aisle, it was then Senator Norm Coleman and I, uh, to get that federal money for that bridge. And we rebuilt it, Bush was president, and we got it done in literally a year. When the 2008 financial crisis hit, um, with a, in the middle of a presidential election, both then Senator McCain, who I miss very much, and Senator Obama, both of whom were running against each other, supported TARP to prevent the banks from collapsing. After natural disasters like Superstorm Sandy, Hurricane Harvey, we get it done. And even in this last year with the coronavirus pandemic, with an incredibly dysfunctional president in place, Democrats and Republicans worked across the aisle to craft several really important federal relief packages to keep us going. Okay, so when it's important, urgent, we respond. And like most people, we don't spend a lot of time in that quadrant of unimportant, not urgent, right? Okay, we're not dumb. But what do we spend a lot of time doing? What does Washington spend a lot of time doing? Urgent, unimportant. Year after year, we respond with frenetic energy to endless contrived and manufactured partisan crisis. Think about the urgency that Republicans brought to getting their hands on President Obama's birth certificate. That was on the news forever and ever. There was nothing else to focus on, but that happened. There are just too many examples to name right now, but if you want more of these um, sort of urgent, unimportant crises, I can tell you whose Twitter account to check after the symposium, but it continues. So our biggest problem is that we often put ourselves in that important urgent box by not spending enough time on the top right-hand quadrant, which is the important, not urgent. If we fail as a country to deal with some of the biggest issues of our time, like infrastructure, immigration, climate change, we're gonna get ourselves as we already are seeing, by the way, with climate change, uh, we are gonna get ourselves into that important urgent. Okay, fine, but it is so much better to get ahead of ourselves. So examples, if we'd been willing to increase our federal investment in infrastructure decades ago, or even a decade ago, maybe we could have avoided some of the rail highway lock and dam problems we've sadly had to deal with. If we had come together to replace aging lead pi pipes, places like Flint, Michigan wouldn't be experiencing or wouldn't have experienced the water crisis they did. If we'd passed comprehensive immigration reform, which we were so close to doing under both President Bush, who really wanted to get it done. I was in that small group with Senator Kennedy uh, that had the honor to work on that, but then we ended up not getting it done or if we would have done it later when President Obama was in, who really wanted to get it done as well, maybe we wouldn't be facing the alarming workforce shortages we are right now, by the way, in Northern Minnesota, or some of the other sad moments where we literally turn away people who could be starting uh, the next great idea to save us from some of these other problems. If we had made earlier investments in addressing climate change, we wouldn't be seeing these once in a generation storms. Warning signs ignored. But to see how this could make some people pessimist, pessimistic is pretty obvious. And so to me, to get to where we want, and I wanna commend the Biden administration for putting a number of people in place that really see the long haul, right? 
They don't just think what's the 24 hour news cycle? What's the tweet at 4 a.m. so we can get all people going, especially on a Saturday morning where we can control the news cycle. But instead of doing a lot of that hard work, we need to build the kind of trust, including with our allies, uh, like the president was doing this week, so we can get things done. Without this kind of trust, you can see why people are pessimistic. And as elected officials, the worst thing we can do is to resign ourselves to being cynical, always eager to tear down and never willing to build up. So yes, there is progress in fits and starts. I mentioned the work we just did on the Capitol policing, um, the work uh, that's being done on infrastructure. And I think it's really important if we go that route that we have a second pack. Uh, my colleague, Senator Cory Booker and Senator Tim Scott are working on crafting bipartisan criminal justice reform legislation. And for myself, I found common ground on everything from my work with Senator Collins to help caregivers, my work with Senator Kennedy to save local news outlets with antitrust reform, and the work I've done with Senator Grassley uh, on everything from uh, renewable fuels to pharmaceutical prices, where he's quite a maverick and willing to take that on to what we just passed last week, the first critical moment on antitrust uh, to get over $100 million to the agencies to actually take on the biggest companies this world has ever known. But there are so many other things like gun safety, raising the minimum wage, the issues I just mentioned on uh, climate change and on, on uh, immigration that just aren't getting done. So how have we gotten things done in this highly polarized atmosphere. There's some bipartisan work going on, it must continue. But I look at the American Rescue Plan, where uh, literally, um, we couldn't get the shots in the arms without it. And we didn't have the kind of infrastructure in place to get the vaccines out. To get that done, we couldn't wait. President Biden couldn't wait. Our leadership couldn't wait here. We had to get it out to the American people. And that's, by the way, how we built some trust up in government again. We used an obscure Senate procedure called budget reconciliation. Okay, this, the rest of my talk is not about budget reconciliation as fun as it um, should be, because I don't think in the end, and I think we will rely on it again, and I've been very clear on this, to get some of the necessary human infrastructure things done that we need to get done uh, in the next few months. But I don't think the answer is that we should rely on weird Senate rules uh, to make progress. It's not sustainable and it won't get at some of the other things uh, that I've talked about. So I always think try as much as you can to get some things done that are bipartisan. You know, it may be small, medium, or even big things like we did last year uh, with a number of the uh, plans in response to the coronavirus pandemic. But what's standing in our way over and over again is the Senate filibuster, which is a relic of an era where it was used by segregation of senators to block civil rights legislation. I believe in the end uh, that it's a hurdle to progress, progress that the American people deserve. It would allow us to get uh, for the people done. It would allow us some version of it, some version of it. Uh, it would allow us to move on gun safety. It would allow us to uh, move on so many other things. 90% of the people want to have universal background checks when it comes to guns. Why can't this place get it done? There should be 90 senators that wanna get it done. It's because we can't quite get to that 60 vote margin. So um, I think you can, there's some people that say, oh, if you get rid of the filibuster, then you're gonna break down all this bipartisanship. As someone who's done a lot with bipartisanship, I don't believe it. I think it actually gives us the leverage to get to a place where we can start working together if we don't have the filibuster. And we shouldn't be letting an archaic Senate rule stop us from making progress. So to end uh, and take some questions from Bob to revisit our original question, how can Congress work better? Well, I don't think there's a more appropriate way to finish uh, than by talking about my friend and colleague, the late John McCain. He was a mentor to many of us. I got to visit him right at the end uh, at John and Cindy's ranch in Arizona with my husband. And even while battling brain cancer, he continued to be engaged in the issues of our time. He could hardly talk, but let's just say he made a few jokes about what was on TV. But my last memory was him taking out his book and pointing to a sentence in the book because he was losing his speech and telling me that's all that matters. And the sentence was this, Nothing in life is more liberating than to fight for a cause larger than yourself. 
That's why I got into politics. I think that's why so many of our colleagues did as well. And if we can live up to this legacy, a fight for causes larger than yourself, that's how our democracy will work. And I'll now turn it back to you, Bob. Um, and I think that um, I'm gonna run to the floor to vote. You, let's count how many seconds it will take me to do it. Ready, set, go, I'll be right back. I'm back. That is amazing. <laughs> well, you see, when you chair the rules committee, you have access to rooms no, close by that you can use sometimes. All right. <laughs> That's a secret. Senator, thank you so much. We know you have a full schedule. I have a couple of questions, and this will also help us build a bridge to the panel discussion. But once again, I can't tell you how, how grateful uh, we are that you could join us. One question that comes to mind that I wanted to ask is, you have been uh, extraordinarily successful in identifying those areas where you can find bipartisan support for a particular legislative initiative. You've done it most recently on a consumer fraud issue with Senator Daines. You've done it, as you pointed out, in areas like antitrust and pharmaceutical pricing and human trafficking, uh, opioid addiction control. And I suppose uh, one question is, how have you thought about the issues that you can pick that enable you to navigate through the really significant divisions that separate the parties and find the ways to start building consensus on some issues so that we can move toward consensus on larger ones? <laughs> I think part of this is getting to know people. Uh, we were just at uh, Vice President Harris's house with the women senators last night. What we always say about our women senators group uh, is whatever's said in that room never goes out of that room. And of course, we never talk about the male senators. Um, but that is an example of a group where I've been able to get to know people like uh, Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski and I mean Marsha Blackburn and I are even working on antitrust together so you know that's one group or I've been a member of the prayer breakfast group which is really interesting uh, you would be again never talk about what happened in there but it's all political stripes uh, that are part of that group Senator Gillibrand heads it up now and people just simply tell stories from their lives um, and you get to know them. It is, um, they're not even always religious stories about their lives, but it's a place uh, where once a week people uh, talk to each other. The Midwestern senators um, with Senator Thune and uh, Senator Rounds and Senator Hoven, and as I mentioned, Senator Grassley, Ernst, um, as well as of course, Tammy Baldwin and my good friend, uh, Tina Smith, and before that, Al Franken, um, and before that, Norm Coleman, um, I, did a, I do a significant amount of work uh, with them um, in a number of areas because we have a kind of a trust relationship and some uh, common uh, interests. And those are just my borderline stage. Personal friendships uh, that people develop with uh, like Senator Blunt and I, it is really hard to do things like we have done, not just chairing the inauguration, but having to uh, come to consensus on changes to the sexual harassment laws in the Senate, and then presenting that to uh, Senator McConnell and uh, Senator um, Schumer. Um, and of course, before that, Senator Reid on how we could uh, get that done. And we passed that, we mandated training for everyone. Uh, one of my favorite bipartisan stories was um, getting Tammy Duckworth's baby on the floor. Uh, when uh, we found out, I said, no problem, I'll help you during votes. You already have a toddler, you know, she's in a wheelchair, a uh, war hero. And one of my favorite memories of that was I, I found out that the rules hadn't changed for like 100 years, except they let a dog on the floor once. And I ended up uh, finding out that, uh, that Orrin Hatch had said to a group of reporters, well, maybe we can have one baby on the floor but what if we have 10 babies on the floor? And I said, we already have 10 babies on the floor. So using some humor when you take these things on uh, can help. And then seeing it as, you know, um, maybe this thing is small or maybe it's actually like Roy and I have done this huge work on tourism. It's gonna make a big, big difference for a major sector, but it leads to relationships that make big differences like what I believe we need to do with the Capitol Police or what we needed to do for that inauguration or what needs to be done on farmer prices and the like. Um, and another way, one other last thing I'd add is that Senator Enzi, one of my friends who uh, retired, he had said that he works under what he calls his 80% rule. And he said, I always believe we could agree on 80% of the issues. And if we focus on that 80%, we can get great things done. And that's what he and Senator Kennedy did uh, to get things done. 
my problem right now and why I kind of got to the issue of the filibuster at the end. I just, I don't think that you don't have to be a cynic to believe there are things you can do on a bipartisan basis. Both things that are crises you have to respond to, you better do that for the sake of our country to be a patriot immediately. And then smaller medium things. But my problem is why I talk about that quadrant is of the long-term things uh, that are important that maybe aren't urgent that day is we're really failing right now as a country to get at those. And Donald Trump was the ultimate example of someone that couldn't get in that box. Well. That's why it led me to believe we should get rid of the filibuster while still doing a bunch of bipartisan stuff because I just think that's the only way to get at those long-term problems. Thank you. And I just, if I could just ask one more question. Sure. You've been now, you're now in your third term in the Senate and you, so you've been in the institution quite a while. You've acquired some seniority. You've seen people come, you've seen people go. Uh, do you do you agree with the assessment that the problem of polarization that we've been talking about has gotten worse? You seem to be working through it. You have apparently a strategy for working through it. But do you think that you're going to need new strategies because the problem is now acquiring a much more serious dimension? Yes. And that's what um, I was referencing with those other problems. I just think that polarization's gotten worse. And there's some reasons for that that's been brewing forever. Uh, one of them is the money in politics mm -hmm. and how instead of just running your own campaign and running against someone else, um, it has become this like larger than life dark money situation where you don't even control what you're doing. Uh, I've been fortunate enough in the Senate races to not really have that happen and to kind of be able to run my own thing and decide what kind of ads I'm running. Uh, but for a lot of people, it's becomes all of these, you know, packs and super packs and the like. Um, and so when that happens, it's very polarizing and it puts people um, in these opposite corners. And that's part of the reason that I want to see campaign finance reform, uh, the way the media covers things right now. Um, and there is just so much, um, you know, one station, the other station that it kind of it not only puts people in different boxes of what they read and what they watch on TV, it also puts elected because sometimes the worst criticism that you can get if you're trying to work in the middle is not from the other side, it's from your own side. And that is especially at play with social media and especially when it's not true, which is one of my obsessions with, if you wanna really move things, you gotta have honesty and honest facts so that people are looking at the same sort of facts, fine. But if they're looking at actually lies, bold faced lies and they believe them, then you have a real problem. Um, so those are kind of two basic things going on, the money um, with and the social media and the coverage that bring people apart, that lead us to this highly, highly polarized situation. Um, and so my answer to that, there's all kinds of policy things you can do, um, but it's also, you still are responsible for your own actions. So you still got to be able to um, buck the trend if you think it's right for this country, and you've got to be able to find common ground. Uh, and I go back to how I, how I started with John McCain and how he did that over and over again. Um, and I still um, believe in that, in a cause larger than yourself. Um, and so even though it's gotten more polarized, I refuse to give up trying to find common ground. But I think, as you noted in the question, I think there are new tools we have to use to get things done. And to me, that filibuster rule and breaking through that um, so that we actually, you know, stop what I would call uh, the tyranny of the minority um, and are able to uh, do big things and make sure everyone can vote and that some people don't tell some people not to vote. And by quoting Reverend Warnock, um, I think that would make a big difference as well and be better for this country. Senator, thank you so much for the time you've given us. And by the way, for the fastest vote I've ever seen cast, extraordinary. <laughs> I know, but I had to blow through. Elizabeth had a group of her friends or people out there, I think it was her family, and I flew up past them. I had to like run through three people who wanted to talk to me, and now I have to go out there and try to fix it. So other than that, it's all good. Well, thank you so much on behalf of all of us, the panel, right. and why you, the dean, we're very grateful. Okay, thank you, Bob. Thank you. See you, bye. So we are now going to move to our panel, uh, and I'd like to introduce the panelists. Uh, 
Paul Kane and Sarah Binder are both here. Good, I wanted to make sure they're, they're, they're up on the screen here. And uh, let me introduce them and say a word also about a third panelist, Jamisha Alcindor, who may be able to uh, join us. It's still a little unclear. She's with the Presidential Traveling Party and uh, she is making her way back from Geneva. And so whether she can phone in later after 5 p.m. or not, we're gonna discover uh, shortly. But uh, let me just very briefly introduce the panelists because anybody who's followed developments on Capitol Hill are well familiar with both of them. But let me begin with Sarah Bender, who is a professor of political science at George Washington and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Sarah is one of the nation's leading political scientists on Congress. Uh, she has written uh, books about the filibusters and causes of stalemate. Uh, in fact, quite a number of books and has really helped to shape and lead the conversation in the academic world. She also, for those of you who enjoy, as I do, the monkey cage in the Washington Post, which is a site where political scientists uh, post a very good informed commentaries on political issues. Uh, she has been an editor of that site. And so we welcome um, uh, Sarah Bender here to the panel. Uh, also on the panel is Paul Kane. I've known him for many years. In fact, since he was a reporter on Roll Call, but as of 2000, uh, and by the way, at Roll Call, he also covered the Congress. 2000, he joined the Washington Post. He is now uh, the senior congressional correspondent at the Washington Post. Uh, he writes a highly regarded regular column on the Congress. I don't know a reporter in Washington knows Congress better than Paul. Also somebody who's covered it as long as he has and continues to have the robust sense of humor that he brings to these issues. Uh, Paul has been well recognized for that coverage and among other things has received the Dirksen Award for Distinguished Reporting on the Congress. And so we're grateful to have both of you and we could be shortly um, joined by uh, Yamish. But perhaps I begin by asking each of you to comment just freeform, however you would like to, picking out the themes you want to emphasize on what you heard from Senator Klobuchar and the topic generally. And I'll begin with you, Sarah. Uh, sure. Well, thanks very much for including me. Um, I thought I would just say, uh, take a couple of minutes to think a little bit more about the notion of partisan polarization uh, and why we think it might be so, uh, as the Senator said, a bit debilitating for the legislative process. What exactly is partisan polarization? I think we tend to use a single term to capture really three different trends in American politics. First, just an increase in ideological polarization. Second, a rise in just sort of sheer partisan team play. And then a third, an increase in electoral competitiveness of the parties. All of these are rising in tandem, basically coming out of the 1980s and increasing uh, ever since. Um, I think it's helpful just to distinguish between them because they each of them seem to play a role in complicating uh, getting to yes uh, on Capitol Hill. Just briefly, ideological polarization, right? The notion that the two parties have drifted apart from one another in their views about the appropriate role of government in solving public problems. Uh, liberals have sorted themselves into the Democratic Party, conservatives uh, into the Republican Party. Long gone are the days where each party had a mix of liberals, uh, moderates, and conservatives. Those days of ideological diversity within the parties, um, those days are over. There's barely anyone left uh, in the middle. Uh, even uh, the Senator of the Hour, uh, Joe Manchin, is probably closer in many ways to his Democratic colleagues than to the core of the Republicans in the Senate and vice versa for Susan Collins, probably more in common with her Republican colleagues than the Democrats. So on basic questions about the role of government, the parties are ideologically at odds with one another. But right, partisans disagree with each other, even when there are no ideological issues at stake. Uh, in other words, we often think of this as just sort of partisan team play. Your team's for it, so my team is against it. Classic example, Republicans liked the individual mandate when it appeared in Romney Care, Massachusetts, but when it, the mandate appears in Obamacare, uh, didn't like it uh, quite so much. So we have ideological polarization, we have team play, uh, and then a third dynamic, just simply the rise in electoral competition. And it's been a really long time, probably since 1984, since we've seen that electoral college map, uh, a landslide, uh, for instance, in 84, the Republicans red map. Right. The name of the game today, small, electorally competitive parties, frequent alteration in control, House, Senate, and now the White House. Expectation is that control is just around the corner of the next election. So um, why does that matter? Like, why does it seem to make legislating so hard? First, it means there's no ideological sweet spot to anchor deal. 
right? The lowest co common denominator between the two parties on any given issue might be really small. Second, if you don't have that sweet spot, both parties have to believe it's in their basic, their electoral interest to go to the bargaining table. Like they seem to, from my view outside the chambers, uh, they seem to ask like, what are the costs if we just say no? And of course, party activists outside Congress or former presidents may in fact reward a party for refusing to cooperate, right? We might think about the filibuster of that January 6th uh, commission uh, in that light. Only when you think you're gonna be blamed by both sides for refusing to bargain, do you actually go to the negotiation tables. Uh, so we might think about the CARES Act in that light or in Senator Klobuchar's uh, two by two, the, the, the urgent and the important box, right? Both parties feeling compelled to address, uh, in this case, the economic harm from the pandemic. Third, if you think your parties is just that control of the House and a White House is just around the corner, well, why negotiate? Why take half a loaf when you can just hold out and see if you win and then decide what to do? And of course, all along, polarization is encouraging rank and file members just to empower their party leaders to act on their behalf. And that probably also is amplifying uh, polarization. Just to wrap up, I think some caveats are in order whenever we think about uh, polarization and dysfunction. Uh, partisanship is not the only cause of the difficulties of uh, legislating, just we can look at the cleavages emerging amongst the Democrats uh, on voting rights, on immigration, on climate, on debt and spending. Second, as the Senator suggested, the rules of the game matter, especially in the Senate. Uh, third, polarization we say is increasingly asymmetric. Republicans seem more inclined to play hardball than do Democrats. And finally, I think all that said, it's probably important not to overestimate dysfunction. Um, big and small stuff does get done, but most of the big tick items, right? Immigration, climate, entitlement reform, others, they remain on the agenda, right? Year after year, but with very little sense uh, that any big change is likely to happen soon. I'll stop right there. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Paul, any opening comments from you and then we'll get into the back and forth. And also well, toward the end, with a few minutes, uh, 10 minutes or so to go, we'll also open it up to questions. So great. Look forward to hearing from the audience as well. Go ahead, Paul. Okay. Um, and thank you for the overly generous introduction, Bob. I, you know, you're 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 too kind. And thank you, NYU, for hosting all of us. Um, I will uh, I will try to sort of explain things in this sort of anecdotal way of which things really, you know, are transpiring up inside the Capitol. Um, and there's a, a story that I always have thought of and thought of again recently because of uh, the late Republican Senator John Warner, uh, his, his death um, a couple of weeks ago uh, in his 90s. He retired in 2008, was this like made from Hollywood senator, swashbuckling, had been served in World War II and the Korean War, was the secretary of the Navy, uh, managed to be one of Elizabeth Taylor's husbands. You know, he was just, and when he was in the Senate, he, you know, later in life, he was initially kind of dismissed as this airhead who liked celebrities, but he became chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee and really built a powerful base and a real sort of bipartisan outlook on life, but not necessarily like as a squishy moderate. Um, you know, he just had moments and times where he would look at his leadership and just say, eh, no, I'm, I'm not going to support Oliver North to be a senator because I think he's a criminal. Um, you know, he voted against Bill Clinton's impeachment uh, articles. Um, he uh, he retired and tried to really get out of politics altogether. And 10 years ago at this point, Tim Kaine, the former Virginia governor, whose uh, family has a, a lineage in Virginia, and so the Kanes know the Warners, and he went to visit John Warner to ask him whether he should run for the Senate because the Senate was just something that Kane didn't think he'd fit into. He was a governor and Warner prefaced it by saying, come visit, but I'm not gonna endorse you. I'm done endorsing people, but come visit. And Warner told Kane that when he first got into the Senate, if there was even a 2% chance that you could win a Senate seat, he would tell every person to 
go for it because the Senate was that powerful and that much fun and important and every senator felt that level of, of, uh, of clout and, and importance. Uh, he said that by the, but by the time he left, he really couldn't say that anymore to people. He finally looked at Tim Kaine and just said, but listen, there's one thing here. He said, the building isn't sick. It's not a, a, a sickness inside Congress. He said, I believe it's the people inside the building that are sick. And he finally just sort of encouraged Kane to take a run at it and see whether or not he could, you know, go there and make a difference. Um, Kane has told that story recently again in, in light of Senator Warner's passing. And, uh, you know, he struggles. He doesn't, you know, he struggles to think whether or not he's really made that difference. Um, it has become a, a place in which and Sarah had hit on this. The biggest change in the day-to-day -day life of Congress right now is just how much of the legislative agenda is entirely controlled inside the House Speaker's office and the Senate Majority Leader's office and just how little input members get on really important issues. And those uh, co coronavirus relief acts of 2020 were heroic and important and, and $3.7 trillion or something like that from March through the end of December, um, you know, just double or triple the annual federal appropriations level. But at the same time, those things just happened. They didn't, they were written on in the conference room of Mitch McConnell's office or the conference room of Nancy Pelosi's office, largely done by Pelosi, then Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, uh, a couple of other aides. Like this was not a broad debate and, and everybody gets involved and you know, there were little fights here and there, but it was pretty much a take it or leave it type of Congress. And because of the nature of the pandemic, people realized they had to take it. And almost all of those bills in 2020 passed by huge bipartisan uh, margins. They were, uh, how did Senator Klobuchar say, they were important urgent, as you put it in the box of uh, Mike Eisenhower. Um, but on the other issues of the day, things are just left to flounder about. A committee chairman has the power to sort of hold a hearing or two on an important issue, but they've got to get permission to really start drawing up legislation. And by permission, they got to go to the speaker or the Senate majority leader, whichever party's in control, and they can be just told to, to shove it. It's not right, it's not ready, you know. And that is just this change of structure in the last 20 years where you just don't have this, the ability for people to come together. They don't even know how to do it these days. So I'll, I'll stop and let you guys fire away with questions and we'll hear from the crowd and hopefully Yamish will uh, be able to chime in. Oh. Did something happen? Oh, you right. mean she's here. That is, it's, uh, we, you are amazing. I don't know how you did this, but you did it. I summoned her. Everybody, uh, let me, no introduction needed, I suppose. I'm, I'm so afraid that you'll disappear, that somebody's going to come from the uh, White House uh, traveling official team and yank the cord on you. Um, but everybody knows uh, Yumi, uh, Yamiche Alcindor. Uh, she is, of course, uh, moderates Washington Week, chief White House correspondent uh, for uh, public broadcast for NPR. Uh, and she appears on NBC, MSNBC. I mean, she's uh, really one of the uh, strong, clear, uh, very influential voices, highly recognized in American journalism today. And boy, thank you so much for joining us. And Thanks for uh, having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Uh, so let me, thank you let for me, that introduction, which was which was lovely, and I'm humbled by. And that was that was a lot. So thank you so much. Well, it's a pleasure. Yamiche, you know, we uh, uh, Sarah opened up to talk a little bit about the sources of polarization. Senator Klobuchar, of course, spoke first and talked about building toward maybe 
achievement on larger issues by finding bipartisan consensus on the issues on which the consensus can be found. So building up toward the urgent and important issues. Uh, Sarah Bender, who's, as you know, political scientist, leading political scientist in the country on Congress and George Washington and a senior fellow at Brookings opened by talking about some of the sources of polarization. And Paul was talking about what was taking place within the institution itself and some of the structural reasons why being a member of the House and the Senate today is not necessarily um, the most emotionally and intellectually fulfilling experience uh, on the face of the earth. Uh, from your perspective, just because we've given everybody a few minutes just sort of to open, can I just ask you this question? How do you see polarization at this point, the, the level of polarization following the Biden election, the extraordinary circumstances, of course, around the president refuse, the former president refusing to concede and the events of January 6, January 20, um, uh, some question about whether President Biden would even take the oath of office in public. How have you? How do you see the current state of uh, polarization on Capitol Hill? Just you know, hardcore nose to nose conflict between Democrats and Republicans affecting the next phases in the Biden administration legislative agenda. Well, I think there are two things. The first is that, um, and again, thanks for for having me for that question. There's this real polarization that I think is either going to be crippling when, and Democrats are going to, in some ways, um, based on my reporting, really get into some infights because there are people like Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema who continue to talk about bipartisanship. They've even talked at some points of, of having a hard line and saying, I won't vote for something if it's not bipartisan. And then you have people like Bernie Sanders and Senator Markey that are just fed up, that feel like Democrats are really wasting their time by pursuing bipartisanship. And you have, of course, President Biden, who has said over and over again that he was elected to be a bipartisan president who really, really wants bipartisanship, but who, of course, is also running up against what critics and, and Democrats have told me really is the playbook of Republicans, which is to stall and to try to, to really stop his agenda altogether. And so I think you add to that. I think that means that, of course, there's, there's negotiations that are so hard to happen. But then when you layer on top of that, this idea that we're not just arguing about policies, right? We're not just arguing about whether or not someone wants this tax break and that tax break. We're arguing about truth, right? We're arguing about the very existence of facts. And I think that that is something that started, that, that was made, made more clear um, and more of a focus during the Trump administration. But I think it's something that has really plagued American politics for some time. And it's now at this inflection point where I feel like no matter what happens, um, when, when you look at political parties, there's just a side that only believes what people from their political party tell them. And it's mainly Republicans, frankly. And then you have Democrats who are in some ways, I think um, their, their constituents essentially are, are getting really frustrated with this idea that they're trying to be bipartisan, that they're trying to, in some ways, convince people of the truth, convince people that vaccines matter, um, convince people that, 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 this, that the way forward out of this pandemic is to have some sort of understanding among, among Americans. So I think that's where I see polarization. I think that it is stalling completely the Biden administration in a lot of key ways. I think it's adding to the to, to the real issues um, of the Democratic Party when you think of the infighting that you see. And then I would say one other thing because I'm I'm in Geneva, Switzerland. All of this kind of um, inability to come to a conclusion um, and to have some sort of common ground, it affects our foreign policy. So you, you have someone like Vladimir Putin today invoking January 6th when talking about human rights, saying the US has its own problems, invoking the idea that the US in our, in our gridlock, that we can no longer be a leader for democracy because essentially US democracy isn't working. And that's of course the claim of the Russian president, President Biden, when I questioned him specifically on that, he said that it was ridiculous to make that comparison, but you see that there really is a an international consequence to the idea that U.S. has domestic policy, domestic domestic politics issues. That's very helpful. Um, do you see? Do you see a? Pause here one second here. Sorry, my alarm was going off. <laughs> no, no, no problem at all. So, just to sort of draw from what you've said here, a conclusion that you may or may not hold. I mean, do you see, for example, on something like HR1, the voting rights issues that are also subject right now to this, you know, to this tension, to the stalemate frustration on the Democratic side, um, some question about whether or not Senator Manchin will show the way along with perhaps Senator Sinema and others to 
some ultimate revision of the program for voting rights that could muster bipartisan consensus. Do you have a sense that there is still the potential for a breakthrough, or is this going to be a slog to the 22, 2022 midterms? When I talk to White House officials on the record and in front of cameras, they say there's clearly uh, there's clearly a deal to be made. There's clearly kind of bipartisanness that can happen, bipartisanship that can happen. But when I talk to White House officials off the record, when I talk to them on background, they're pretty stark about, they're pretty blunt about the idea that it's going to be really, really hard to find bipartisanship because 2022 is, of course, starting to define more and more these conversations. People um, like Kevin McCarthy are thinking about their futures as the House Speaker. So the last thing that a lot of Republicans, frankly, that I talked to say that they don't want to hand a win to this president. They don't want to hand a win to President Biden. And then, of course, again, I think you have Democrats who are saying, okay, we have all of this power. How can we go back to our constituents and say we found no way to stop voting rights? and the re voter restriction laws that are being going that are being passed by the GOP even though we had control of the White House the Senate and the House that's going to be a tough thing based on my, my reporting talking to Democrats it's a tough thing for them to think through but okay, again you have President Biden saying this is really up to the Senate um, I pushed the president a, a couple of times on the idea of a filibuster and it's in some ways yes you can ask the president about it but this really comes down to the senators and the senators including Senator Manchin he does not want to change this he does not want to change the filibuster, which is the key thing to really get behind the For the People Act. And of course, we saw um, Senator Manchin come out and say that he's not even in favor of the For the People Act. And I have to say, as much as we, there's all this talk of Senator Manchin, if you look, talk to Hill sources, and especially if you talk to Hill reporters that I interview sometimes on Washington Week, they'll tell you that it's not just J Joe Manchin. That Joe Manchin sometimes is the fall guy. He's sometimes the person that everyone says. But that there are other Democrats in the Senate that have real issues with the For the People Act and are, are in some ways very nervous about tackling voting rights as all of these Republicans are having a lot of success changing the voting laws in our country in the states. So the, the question for Sarah and Paul to respond to some of the themes that uh, Yamish struck here, do you see um, the potential that perhaps voting rights just by virtue of the content of that material, right, the very fraught or t uh, significant political implications of the battle over voting rights that both parties see in that struggle. Do you see that that's perhaps the wrong way to measure it? Should we be looking at something like infrastructure and then sort of in, in succession, Sarah, Paul, and then back to Yamish, is there then more of a potential for breaking through this on something like infrastructure? Sarah, what do you think? Well, I, from outside the institution, one, one would think that infrastructure should be easier than a clearly uh, partisan uh, charged issue of, of voting rights. Um, the problem, though, is that even on something that seems innocuous as roads and bridges, it turns out there's a disagreement about or a manufactured disagreement about what constitutes uh, infrastructure. And even if there's an agreement on infra infrastructure, there are core issues about how to pay for it. And the parties don't seem all that close. Uh, and they may, Paul, maybe Paul will tell us they, they're on the verge of <laughs> solving it, but they don't all seem quite that close to resolving even that core question of, 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 the, of the quote unquote pay fors. And just a reminder, this isn't all that new, right? Keep in mind the last time there was a highway bill, um, it was extended and extended and extended because I couldn't figure out the pay fors. At the end, I think it was 2015, they grabbed some money they saw on the shelf of the Federal Reserve, and that was a perfect solution. And I wouldn't put it past them uh, to find some more money uh, hidden over at the Fed. So uh, infrastructure, we think, should be. It should be non-ideological, we think. It should be nonpartisan. But that doesn't seem to be the way that essentially the chips are falling here. Both parties have to think it's in their electoral interest to act. Um, and that hurdle, uh, true, they're at the sort of negotiating table a bit, uh, but it doesn't seem to be producing uh, big dividends yet so far. Paul, do um, you hear differently? Well, let me, I'll, I'll, I've got two bits of sort of news. They're not, it's not quite breaking news, but um, Manchin has been getting asked today in the Capitol about voting rights. And um, he's been sending around some ideas um, that, that he could get supportive of. Now, one of those, uh, I'm, I'm basing this on uh, a competitor at CNN's tweet, but one of those is some form of voter ID requirement, uh, which would probably be an anathema to a lot of 
uh, liberals who feel that those requirements have historically been used as a way to, uh, you know, to hit voters of color in particular. Um, so I, that is an issue that seems to be going sideways at the moment. Um, but it just landed in my inbox. Um, there are 20 senators, 10 Republicans, 10 Democrats who this is going to be, once you really get through the words, it's just a lot of words, but they're on a statement together saying, we support this bipartisan framework that provides an historic investment in our nation's core infrastructure needs without raising taxes. Uh, there's one other sentence that is just a garble of words. I don't know that there, that's still a long way to go. That's 20 votes. You need 40 more in the Senate. Um, you, you have a lot of, uh, of the more liberal Senate Democrats who are saying, we'll go along with a bipartisan infrastructure deal if there is an ironclad guarantee that we also have the larger climate and, uh, and all the other social welfare programs that were proposed in the sort of the human side of the, of the Biden agenda. As long as that is moving almost concurrently, they would be willing to go along with a bipartisan infrastructure deal. Um, and you still have to get to pay fors and they're saying it's not going to raise taxes. Well, then how's it going to be paid for? Um, you know, are you just reprogramming money? Or are you finding money at the Fed as they did in 2015? Um, you know, it, it was the 2015 bill was basically written by Mitch McConnell and Barbara Boxer. Barbara Boxer was the top Democrat on the Public Works Committee. And one day after that bill finally passed, after it had been extended and extended and extended, um, I saw her walking out of Mitch McConnell's office carrying a Louisville slugger. And I stopped her and I said, let me guess, is that, does that have your signature and signed in it? And McConnell got Louisville Slugger in his hometown to, to make that for you? And she's like, yes, do you want me to hit you with it? <laughs> um, it? It is a real struggle. And look, I talked to Ed Markey yesterday who is having panic attacks that they're reliving 2009 all over again, because in 2009, the House got its work done. The House Energy and Commerce Committee passed out a cap and trade bill for climate change that passed on the House floor at the end of June. And then by um, the end of July, early August, their committee had put out a, uh, the, the bulk of what became the Affordable Care Act. And he's sitting around watching things right now. And, you know, the committees aren't even moving right now. Back then, the committees were already moving. Um, they had decided which tracks they were going on. And right now, he's looking at this saying, my gosh, if we get to the August recess and we still don't even have the committees putting out product, you know, we're going to, it's going to be 2009 all over again, and we're going to get pilloried and the whole political environment will be blowing up against them. So the Democrats are, they're really up against the time frame here about choosing which path to take and how quickly to get moving on it. Um, you know, so Yamish is right in that sense. Um, you know, but the narrower the margins historically, you, you sometimes get some nice bipartisanship, but to Sarah's earlier point, you also get each side digging in because they know all we need is, you know, the Republicans in the House only need five seats if, you know, the in the current map to get that majority. And Mitch McConnell needs just one seat. And it gets harder and harder the closer you get to an election. So people like Ed Markey are saying, we've got to make a decision because by next year, it's, it's going nowhere. Well, so that brings me to a question, and Yamish, I'll start out with you on this one. Do you think this ultimately comes down to um, a meaningful showdown or the, uh, over the filibuster, or that's actually not going to transpire? I mean, is that, that's just simply not going to happen here. As Senator Klobuchar discussed this at length as something that just ultimately was unavoidable in breaking the impasse on the 
urgent and important issues. What is what is your reporting and your sense of the situation suggest to you about where that debate over the filibuster is going? Somewhere or nowhere? It's a it's hard to say. Um, I think if I based on my reporting that I would say it's going somewhere. That's only because I talked to so many progressive Democrats and Democrats who say this is the issue. This is the holdup. This is why even when we have a majority majority that we can't actually get things done. Um, I also think it's interesting when you see someone like Jim Clyburn, who of course has the ear of President Trump, say there need to be at least some rules to work around the filibuster when it comes to civil rights and voting rights. So I think that this will still be a robust conversation because people like AOC will continue to in some ways hammer Senator Manchin and other senators. Whether or not it turns into a robust conversation and, and an actual um, negotiation on what can change in the filibuster, I would say that I would in some ways leave that to, to the Hill reporters because I, my sense just talking to the White House is that there really isn't movement unless it's going to happen on the Hill. The president, even if he changes his mind, which I have gotten no sense that he will change his mind in terms of, of, uh, of backing a change on the filibuster, this really comes down to whether or not a couple senators um, want to possibly risk being reelected in order to, to change the filibuster. Um, and I think that we're just going to continue to see a lot of talk about this, but I, I in some ways lean toward this idea just based on, on, my, ta on, on my sourcing um, that is largely based in the White House, that this isn't going to turn into an actual change of the filibuster or even like coming close to that. And Sarah, what, how should we be thinking about the significance of the filibuster issue? I mean, is, there, is it really a point of long overdue institutional reform or is it merely you know, total frustration uh, that uh, is leading this to become sort of a centerpiece of the dialogue on Capitol Hill. I mean, is this something that we're, we were headed toward eventually anyhow, or are we just in the moment on the filibuster? So the, the filibuster really, it's an age old problem for the Senate, right? We've had debates and conflict over whether and how to reign in the filibuster back in the 19th century in the 1890s, around World War I, when they eventually created the cloture rule to have their very first uh, rule for cutting off debate, albeit by a supermajority. So, and even over that 100 years of the cloture rule uh, up through uh, today, there have been incremental changes here. And they pretty much all move in the direction of making it easier to invoke cloture, to cut off debate, or to limit like what cloture can be uh, applied what you can filibuster, for instance, getting away with nomination filibusters. So, and once you, I think as uh, Senator Shelby said, or right when the Democrat, when the Republicans took back control in 2015, and they were discussing, well, maybe we should restore the nomination filibuster. And he said, you know, once you squeeze the toothpaste out, you can't get it back in the tube, right? And, and that's how I think about these changes in the Senate rules is, you change the rule, you limit minority rights in some way, like you rebalance a little bit majority rule and minority rights, and it's very hard. Senators adjust, right? Uh, McConnell may go on the floor and attack Harry Reid for doing it, but you know, soon enough, uh, the Republican majority decides to uh, nuke their own uh, set of filibusters. So the long arc here is towards majority rule. Do they get there, this Congress? I'm defer to our illustrious reporters who know, really know what's going on. It's, it does seem that Manchin, either for himself or as a lightning rod uh, for other uh, apprehension than the Senate Democratic Caucus, um, they don't seem likely to get there this year. Um, but I think eventually uh, there'll be uh, more and more limits put on uh, the use of the use of cloture. And if I could add one thing that as, as Sarah was talking that came to me um, just this week when we heard Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, who really is almost operating like a Senate Majority Leader in some ways in terms of his veto power. Um, when, when we heard him say that he's likely going to deny President Biden a Supreme Court pick in 2024, I could feel the blood pressures of the Democrats rising because they're saying here again is the, the, the Republican Party doing exactly what it wants to do, leaning in all the way doing it, making making the rules um, work in their favor. And here we as Democrats, thinking about the, the Democrats I talked to, they're saying we can't even get the filibuster figured out. We can't even kind of do the basic things like civil rights and human rights um, that we want to do. So I think that that's why you're going to continue to have this conversation. But obviously you have some some strong-willed Democrats and, and Joe Manchin and others who say it's a fun, it would be fundamentally breaking the Senate and they don't want to do that. Yeah, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but he went so far as to say he 
wasn't moving a Supreme Court nomination in 2024 if he controlled the Senate and he would not be prepared to commit on 2023. Indeed. Yes. Yeah. Paul, do you see the do you see the filibuster sort of situation, sort of where it comes from? Do you think, well, first of all, do you think the arc bends toward eventual, you know, increased change in the direction of more majoritarian control and filibuster is in one way or the other lightened up, if you will, modified for particular issues, et cetera? Um, yeah, listen, it, I think it, it, I think it bends in that arc, but it's a slow, it's a slow moving bend. Um, I, in our days of wearing masks, one of the masks that I used to wear was a, one of the DC flag and a uh, Senate Democrat saw it one day and we just chatted off the record and he, he loved it. And he's a big uh, supporter of DC statehood. And, um, you know, he, he said, you know, it's going to become a state one, one day within about 10 years. He said about 10 years. And I said, why 10? He goes, you know, eventually the filibuster is going to fall. And that was from a liberal Senate Democrat who clearly had, in his mind was not expecting it to come in these two years. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that I have decided to, that to, with Joe Manchin's words is, you know, take him literally and take him seriously. Um, you know, he, he published an op-ed in the Washington Post, great newspaper, great organization, um, in uh, early April, basically saying he would not blow up the filibuster. And then two months later to the day, published another op-ed in one of his hometown newspapers in West Virginia, explaining his opposition to the For the People Act. And it was essentially the same op-ed. He keeps saying the same things over and over. Um, I wish he would kind of stop talking. One of his problems is that I think he does enjoy the attention that we give him in the media. And so he's always stopping and talking in the hallways. And there's like the slightest bit of calibration in his comments of, he said something about the talking filibuster once. And then it just set off these waves of days and days of we're trying to parse every bit of, of Manchin. Um, my a colleague at Politico, Burgess, Burgess Everett calls it Manchometer. Um, he'll particularly tweet about what the Manchometer is like on a given day. And apparently it's very high up there today. Um, but it is going to take time and you know, the incentives for Democrats on the filibuster and Republicans are really kind of different. And it's really just a governing perspective. The Democrats actually really want to do a lot more in terms of legislating and in terms of governance. You know, Republicans, Mitch McConnell never really blew up the filibuster because there was nothing that he needed it for. Um, they're able to cut taxes um, on the reconciliation, budget reconciliation, which allows him to do it on a simple 51 vote margin. The only things that he really cared about legislatively um, were trying to repeal Obamacare and uh, cut taxes. And he went one for two in 2017 on that and then just kind of sat back and was, you know, happy to just sit there and not do anything except confirm judges. Um, Democrats have a bigger, broader agenda. They want to do more things than Republicans. So this becomes an issue that is more uh, ripe for them so that at some point, I think they'll, they will be the ones if they can get to a majority, uh, a real majority. And this is one thing about elections having consequences. A lot of people built up expectations. Um, and in my reporting, I'm guilty of it, that they were, the Democrats were going to get up to 53, 54 seats, and that Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema wouldn't quite matter as much. And, you know, sorry, Bob, your party did nice. The three seat gain and the majority is a huge thing. But, you know, Sarah, if you really are mad, don't forget to, if you're a Democratic activist and you're mad about this, don't forget to blame Sarah Gideon for really running a, a dramatically underperforming campaign in Maine. And Cal Cunningham and his um, extramarital affairs cost him a seat in North Carolina. And, you know, they, they need to uh, get 
and it will probably take another couple of election cycles where they can have the, the diversity growth in some of these states so that they can get to a majority that is really governable beyond just one or two senators being able to sort of block things. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question about political leadership style. Senator Klobuchar was saying, um, Yamish, and then I want to ask each one of you what you think about this, because it comes up all the time in discussions of Senate gridlock and dysfunction, the role of personal relationships. Senator Klobuchar said it was indispensable to her to build personal relationships. Of course, President Biden is known, having you know been in the Senate for so many uh, years, as somebody who built relationships out of his um, this distinctive personal style that he enjoyed working across the aisle. He was close to Senator John McCain. Uh, and uh, he has prided himself and said during the primaries that he thought there was life after Trump uh, in the relationship between the Democratic and Republican parties. One of our audience members um, asked the question, um, how large is a, uh, is this a, how large a factor is this? And to what extent, if it is a factor, is it exacerbated by the fact that Members of Congress go in and out of Washington, D.C. They return to their districts on the weekends. They, there are not institutional mechanisms for them to get to know one another in the way that Senator Klobuchar said she tried very hard to get to know uh, Republicans. Um, and the question, the way the questioner puts it at the end is, do you think they'll ever get back to living where they work? Um, I, I'll start with you, Yamish. First of all, do you think, because obviously people hope for that, that President Biden's style, sort of open arm style and sort of form of personal diplomacy across the aisle can still have an effect? Or are the forces of polarization just simply too overwhelming, even with that effort? And then I'll ask each one of you, uh, you know, Sarah and Paul, to weigh in on this whole question of, you know, does it actually, outside of some successes that some particularly skilled politicians like Senator Klobuchar have had, can we really expect personal relationships to change even if they were to spend the weekends in Washington? So I'll start with you, Yamish, on what you think about how much of an impact Senator President Biden's particular style in that respect might have had? I think it's a great question. I think that um, the Washington that I never covered, which was the Washington of the 90s, um, that that was a that, that relationships were just it, were just more important from based on my conversations. Lawmakers now are so um, they're so polarized. Their social media and kind of the way that they're seen is so hyper focused and so. Um, and, and, and so I think created in some ways on viral moments um, that personal relationships, I think just aren't um, able to even be formed in the same way. That being said, I mean, Joe Biden obviously got elected on this idea that he was gonna be Joe from Scranton who could sit down with everybody and talk. And there has been, of course, this, this real interfacing that he's had with Republicans. We've had so many Republicans coming through the White House. He's had one-on-ones with Senator um, Moore Capito and others, that being said, at least based on infrastructure, and I think that that's the big one that I'm kind of judging this on. What you hear from Republicans is, okay, yes, the president likes us. He he talks. We can have a, a nice conversation. But at the end of the day, the things that we fundamentally disagree on are one: what are the definitions of things like infrastructure, um, and two: how do we pay for things? And that, of course, can be pay for COVID, or pay for infrastructure, or pay for healthcare, or pay for education. I mean, the list goes on and on about the differences, the fundamental differences. And when you talk to the White House, I think that they're pretty open about the idea that yes, they do want to change the way that infrastructure is talked about. So you also have a White House that's saying, yes, we do think that you should go past roads and bridges and we should be talking about the historical wrongs of where the highways went. We should be talking about home health care workers. Um, so there's also, I think, those fundamental value differences that you're seeing. And I think that complicates how much personal relationships can impact whether or not things actually get done in Washington. Now, I wasn't there, um, and Paul, maybe you have more information on this, but Vice President Harris did have this sort of bipartisan partisan women's um, dinner. I'm, I haven't seen all of the reporting that came out of that, but to me, it is interesting that you're seeing her reach across the aisle and say, let's just have this sort of la ladies dinner to, to, to really um, get a sense that we are women working together in Washington. But again, I think until we see actual concrete policies and deals come out of these meetings, they're nice meetings, but I, I think it's the, the limits of, of what can actually happen, even when you have good interpersonal relationships in 2021, um, just seem very, very far that the, that the limits are, are pretty hard line here. Mm -hmm. Sarah, what, what are your thoughts about that question of does it really matter? 
Um, so I'm, I'm, I certainly agree about the, the limits of these relationships and what they can achieve in this broader kind of super partisan environment. I, I would think about it this way is that if, if there's no, as we were talking about at the opening, if there's no ideological core, right, no sweet spot on which the parties can agree, more often when there are deals, it, it, it's usually one side gets its most preferred outcome and the other side gets their most preferred outcome and you give a little bit on the, on the others. So the, the ones that come to mind, even something like the CARES Act, right, where the Democrats for part of it, the enhanced unemployment benefits, is what, they're, what I saw to be a, a core priority. Republicans wanted the payroll protection uh, loans for small businesses. Well, rather than trying to veto the other party's priorities, they both got thrown in the package or um, you know, immigration reform that made it through the Senate in the 2013, but not the House, right? There was path to citizenship for the Democrats, their priority. There on the other side, there was um, border security. And then there was another group, right? The, the, the guest workers for agriculture businesses, All right? That's, you, you can't make those, uh, those trade-offs, right? Unless you know who's on the other side of the table, you have to know what their top priorities are. And that's the environment in which relationships can matter. There just aren't very many of them, it seems, anymore, right? I think of uh, Lamar Alexander uh, and uh, uh, Patty Murray, right? A, a number of uh, agreements that came out of that committee because they, they know the other side, they know what they're looking for. Or a Henry Waxman and Blylis, I guess, from Virginia on FDA and uh, uh, I guess it was chemical reforms. So they're possible. There aren't a lot of them, but I do think they make a difference uh, to the extent that issues uh, get the blessing of party leaders, as Paul was referencing, uh, so that the committees can actually uh, found, find some arena in which uh, to try to negotiate. Paul, any perspective you have? Sure, I'll try to be quick. On those people, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll start with something negative and, and bring us back to January 6th. Um, that dinner last night in the vice president's uh, residence, uh, the invitation was to all 24 uh, women who are in the Senate. Um, only 21 showed up. Uh, one, Kirsten Cinema, has like a broken ankle from some ultra marathon that she did. And she had a big presentation today on this bipartisan infrastructure thing. And it was kind of understood that she wasn't gonna be there. Uh, the other two women who did not show up uh, were Senator Hyde Smith of Mississippi and Senator Lummis of Wyoming. Um, the most in the thing that they have most in common is that they both voted against certifying the Biden Harris victory in the election. So they appear to have not wanted to go even have dinner at the vice president's uh, residence. Um, in terms of you know Biden and his uh, you know. It is a relationship building. Like it, it's true, and you, I, I have. We pre-write obituaries uh, in this business. It's sometimes kind of creepy when you talk to people about it. I've written a first version of Joe Biden's that was done six years ago that I have to tear up and rewrite. But that initial version was about how Biden's career as a senator and vice president had three key conservative boogeymen who liberals hated that he was able to work with, Strom Thurmond on the Judiciary Committee, Jesse Helms on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and then as Vice President, he and Mitch McConnell brokered a lot of deals. And so there is some, you know, there is some semi-recent history to this. Um, but at the same time, I did a little Google search to figure this out. And today's US Senate has just 31 senators who served in the Senate with Joe Biden. You know, the other 69 arrived when he was either vice president or, you know, retired and now president. The people aren't there that Joe Biden was making deals with. They're, some of them are literally dead. It's not just a dying breed metaphorically, it's, it's a dying breed. So that's, that, that makes it harder. Um, even more, we've talked a lot about the Senate and the filibuster. The House of Representatives right now is a cauldron of, of just open hostility that I have never seen. And it, it, 
comes straight out of January 6th and a belief on the Democratic side that a certain small number of Republicans, you know, either were openly support the insurrection effort or tacitly support it. Um, and it has, it has left that place just torn apart. There's uh, 50 or 60 freshmen and for combined and Democrats and Republicans alike um, who didn't get to really have a normal orientation because of the pandemic. Normally there would be bipartisan dinners and there's a bipartisan retreat to Harvard IOP and a trip down to Williamsburg and these things where they can try and build a little bit of a relationship. That didn't happen. And then on their third day, their third full day in office as freshmen, the Capitol was ransacked. And the, the house right now is just, just being torn apart by this, this, this feeling of, you know, one side thinks the other was trying to kill it and the other side is mad because they think we were trying to kill one another. And it, it's, it's really a dark place. One slight thing of, of optimism is this little bipartisan committee, evenly divided, called the Select Committee on Modernizing Congress that Pelosi started. Um, it's uh, evenly divided, Republicans and Democrats, they just try to come up with things that can make the place work a little bit better. Um, they don't even sit, when they do committee hearings, they sit interspersed, Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat. Um, they, they are, you know, trying to, they're not trying to solve immigration, but they're trying to solve these problems that we're talking about right now. Next week, they're gonna have experts in and conflict resolution experts from like marriage, <laughs> marriage experts and really outside the box labor, labor negotiators for both sides of corporate and labor and to, to try to talk about what to do to the place to make it work better. Um, it, it, there's, there are people out there that are trying. I don't know that they can be successful, but there are people that are trying. That's my, my glimmer of hope. Well, it's good to have some hope. Let me ask, because uh, Yamish, as long as we still have you with us, um, and then uh, I think there's an aspects of this I, that, that I'd like Sarah and, and Paul also to speak about. So the, but President Biden just took his first foreign trip, and there was uh, some discussion in the press about here was an area around China, around Russia, where you saw Republicans saying some of the same things the Democrats were saying. So that there was some ground here that the two political parties were occupying. Um, is that real or just at a rhetorical level? In other words, not that I think would necessarily have an effect on, say, you know, infrastructure agreement to reach infrastructural reform or voting rights or whatever, but do we actually have something on the issue agenda of the day of politics stopping at the water's edge here or not? What is your sense of it after having been on this trip and watching some of the reaction to it? Um, I think I, I think if I had been answering this question before I left for the trip, I would say definitely there's um, overlap when it comes to foreign policy. And I think that that's probably so true when it comes to, the, of, of course, Russia meddling in our elections. And I think we're starting to get to, get to a Republican Party that is at least maybe thinking a little bit differently than President Trump, just on the idea that Russia could be a bad actor, because let's remember, three years from now, I was in Helsinki, Finland, standing in the room, sitting in the room. Um, in some ways thinking that I had over, that I had misheard President Trump when he said that he believed Vladimir Putin over the US intelligence agencies over whether or not um, Russia had meddled in our elections. So I think there is this sense that that, that Republicans in particular can be, take a little bit harder line on Russia, definitely can can say that, that China can be a bad actor and that we need to be doing more on that front. But then I, I think about what just happened in the last week. So you have two things that happened first, Pres President Biden, I was at the NATO summit. He he was pretty um, critical of Republicans when he when 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 asked about kind of their their obstructionist um, and and their and the way that they have kind of led to gridlock in his mind in Congress. And that, of course, was President Biden um, really going after Republicans overseas, obviously, while he was overseas. But let's also remember, and I and we, I think you have to point this out, which is that Republicans have been attacking. President Biden while he's overseas. And he's been, and just today, 
with this summit, you had the RNC sending uh, messages before the meeting even ended saying that this was showing weakness, that President Biden was rewarding President um, Putin with a meeting, that this was completely the wrong direction. Afterwards, you had senators that were releasing statements saying that President Biden had essentially um, really messed up here when it comes to foreign policy. These were This is the same party, of course, that really did, if not defend former President Trump, at least weren't openly critical of the way that he talked about Russia. So I think in some ways, I would think that um, just based on my reporting over the last week, that foreign policy seems to be just as polarizing as every other issue. Um, and that, yes, there might be a little bit of um, overlap when it comes to people not wanting to be in gas lines because of a Russia ransomware attack and, and want to grill on, for me, on, on Juneteenth <laughs> this weekend um, and not have their meat be taken away. But I think there is this feeling that things are so polarized right now that um, it's really hard to, to, to see an overlap. And I guess the other thing I would add is, you know, we've all been talking about kind of um, the differences in policies and pay for us. I still think all of this fundamentally comes down to the fact that you have two parties that fundamentally don't believe in the same sort of democracy. If you talk to Democrats, they say it's not just voter suppression. It's not just um, the, the, the Republicans calling into question whether or not President Biden is, is the, the legitimate president. You also have this idea of voter nullification, because I've been talking to a lot of civil rights experts, some who, 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 were, in, who were active in the 1960s, and say, that's what we should be calling this, because Republicans are now basically saying, if you don't agree with us, we will find a way for your vote not to count. And then you have Democrats who are saying, well, can we just kind of operate on facts when it comes to the vaccine or anything else? And they're saying they're, that Republicans don't want to even deal with, with kind of the facts um, at hand. So I think, you know, in all of this talk of can there be polarization or can there be the talk of filibuster? Fundamentally, we can't even agree on the sky being blue, right? Like it's 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 the fundamental truth. Um, and I remember being on set with, at, with on Meet the Press when Rudy Giuliani said truth isn't truth. And I think that that was a window into the Republican Party in particular um, and, and, the, and the real polarization that we're seeing. It's that truth in some people's minds literally isn't true. So uh, right off of that point, I wanna ask a question of Zara and Paul, and I have a concluding question from one of the members of our audience. And thank you for bearing uh, with us this long, thank you. But let me ask you this question. Um, Sarah, you mentioned that things were, and, and this really does directly relate to the comment that Yamish made about sort of what we're seeing on the Republican side versus what we're seeing on the Democratic Party. You, you have said, and there are political scientists like Tom Mann and Nora Mornstein who have written, there's been this significant asymmetry in partisanship. Um, and that's obviously been very controversial with Republicans who are very quick to say that's, you know, that's just simply not true. And they try to point to what they believe are the signs of, you know, uh, very polarized uh, thinking uh, in what they would like to believe is the ascendant hard left of the Democratic Party. Do you think asymmetry uh, in the kind of man Ornstein sort of view of the world remains as stark as it seemed to them when they wrote the book? Do you think that that's changing? And then Paul, and then I did have a concluding question for all of you, but let, let's talk about that just for a second, asymmetry. Well, sure, I think if anything, this notion of asymmetry between the parties that the Republicans have gone off, whether you're right, my left, right, uh, further to the right, I think that was the initial notion. Um, it's become even more asymmetric among all sorts of other dimensions, not just sort of ideology, right? We're not just talking about the Freedom Caucus with a particular set of conservative beliefs, right? We're, we're talking about a party that seems to revolve around whether or not you're for Trump or against Trump. That's not really about policy. Um, I, as a political scientist, I don't use the word cult, but many might say it's a bit of a cult uh, on the Republican side. Um, that seems to be translate into all sorts of behavior that it's really hard to see how the two sides can can talk to one another, right? Whether it's the vote yesterday on uh, commendations for uh, the Capitol Police in which 20 Republicans decided to vote against it, who were also the group who were voting against uh, certifying electoral college votes. So, uh, or the general uh, disagreement about whether or not to investigate the insurrection. So uh, if anything, things uh, were, have gotten even further uh, off the charts, I think, uh, in terms of the type of behaviors we see, even beyond what uh, Tom and Norm were uh, talking about uh, even a decade ago. Okay, thank you. Paul, any thought on that? Yeah, um, 
there's a there's a fundamental thing. I, I sort of hit at this earlier, um, and the 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 difference between uh, Congresswoman Ocasio Cortez and pick somebody on that far right, uh, Taylor Green, Mo Brooks, et cetera, is that you know fundamentally at the end of the day, liberal progressives do believe in government and they want government to actually happen and function. And so you saw it in the last previous two years where there were moments where the, uh, the liberal wing of Nancy Pelosi's caucus could take down legislation uh, if they wanted to. And in the end, they, they wouldn't. They would, they would you know, find ways to wiggle around it, have a bunch of people vote present and the bill would pass. And that way they would be able to say, I didn't vote for that. I think that bill was kind of junk, but you know, we have to do something to help these kids at the border who are being separated from their parents and thrown in cages. Um, for, for the far, far, far right Republicans, they really don't like, I don't, I'm not saying this in, in this is an observed fact, like they really don't care. And like government collapsing to them is not something that they that they care about. I Mark, Mark Meadows, as a member of Congress, sat there in the just off the House floor, telling me and a couple of others in December 2018 how he was going to lobby Donald Trump, in part through Fox News appearances, to shut down the government. And and he didn't like he had no plan. He didn't really care. It was just he he was happy to shut down the government. And they shut down the government for 35 days. Um, so the asymmetry there is that, you know, the far, far, far right Republicans right now really just don't care a whole lot about governance. And that is like a really you know, a dangerous weaponizing thing. Um, you know, and yesterday I was in the House chamber and I watched it, you know, as 21 Republicans voted against giving uh, the gold medal to the Capitol Police and the DC police who, you know, who defended them on that particular day. Um, you know, like, there is, and, and right now they're going to have a vote uh, any minute now on the House side to make Juneteenth a national federal holiday. It passed by unanimous consent, essentially 100 to zero in the Senate. Um, there are going to be a bunch of House Republicans who vote against this. I don't want to set like an over under like I'm some Vegas sports book, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was two dozen similar to yesterday. Um, they are just it, 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 it is a very is a very anti government force in the far right flank of Republican politics right now that is, you know, pretty dangerous. And that's the, the, to me, the biggest difference. And that's the, where the asymmetry is because in the end, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez does want government to work. It, it's, a, it's a very far left version of government working, but she does want government to work. Okay, thank you. Right, so here is my concluding question to you. It's from one of our, and I'll read it to you, one of our audience members, it's sort of a good, it's a good uh, global concluding question and I'll read it verbatim. The speakers seem to conclude that the current polarization will continue long into the future. It's not always been that way, however, and isn't it possible that with different political leadership or because of external events, election results might end the 50-50 current division. Is there no hope of that? Any, any, but we'll just see, this is on the hope, no hope meter, at least for the, um, for the foreseeable future. So Yamish and then Sarah and then Paul, what do you think? Yamish? I was really hoping Paul was going to go first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, is there hope? You know, as a reporter, I am, I'm kind of in some ways based in only what I can see in front of me and the people and what people tell me and what, what I see. And, and I just don't really see a way um, when you have someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene and AOC and this, this argument over whether or not Biden is, is the legitimate president right now, um, because you, I just don't see how how this turns into um, bipartisanship and turns into this somehow getting better because I think what you're seeing unless uh, unless districts change is more and more rewarding of um, of kind of deep polarized views and 
especially on the Republican side, you know, Sarah didn't want to call it a cult. I don't think I would call it a cult either, but there is this cult of personality. And I think Republicans will, will say that on the ground to you. I've interviewed a lot of state Republicans who will say, yeah, if you're with Trump, then you're really with the Republican party. And if you're against him, then you are. And they're saying, well, he was, he's the last president of the, of the GOP. How in the world can you call yourself a conservative and a Republican and not back him? So I think if, if Trump is continuing to be the sort of litmus test for Republicans, I think it's really hard um, as he is still actively questioning the 2020 election, so actively spreading all sorts of conspiracy theories um, that you get to a point where polarization is gonna be something that's on the, on, on the down. I just, and you also, the other thing I think maybe that's lost, I think sometimes in national politics is so much of this is state politics, right? So when you look at the average state Republican official and the people who have power in the states, they're people who came into power in the last couple of years who see Trump as the person that that is motivating them. Um, and that's why you saw some of these senators, these Republican senators who voted to impeach Trump or who voted to say that it was wrong for him to to call into question the 2020 election they were getting censured in, at home so when you see that um it, it's in some ways i think it's it's um it's it's a it's a telltale sign of of kind of how deeply polarized things are that even after something like january 6th which i would say as a reporter i had seen so many low points in, in, and kind of ridden the the trump scandal wave that I thought January 6th, maybe much like I thought Newtown, Connecticut after that mass shooting was gonna shift things. I looked up and realized, no, we're, we're kind of where we were after Newtown, nothing really shifted. It was really horrible and we're really sad and people cried and there was real hurt around the country, but fundamentally what changed, not much. And I think January 6th, at the time, the day of, when I was standing on the lawn, talking to White House sources who were saying that President Biden was watching it on, I mean, President Trump was watching it on TV, sort of feeling, you know, not, he didn't want people to die, but he was also saying, these are my people kind of having my back. Um, there was a sense that this was kind of the end of something. And now I really think talking to sources, talking to people on the ground, that January 6th might be the beginning of something. I mean, a completely new phase that we don't know how to handle in, in, in American politics. Sarah, but that, that was not a cheerful conclusion, but I'll, <laughs> uh, Sarah. Well, on, on the one hand, um, nothing is forever in American politics and at least historically war, depression, uh, economic crisis has generated uh, either new issues or cleavages or some change. I, I think what gives me pause though about expecting uh, any big change or shakeup of the system anytime soon though, is that the the cultural change, the social change, these racial antagonisms that are helping to fuel uh, the disagreements between the parties, right? The sense that uh, Southern whites and Northern whites feel that they are an increasing minority and an increasingly diverse uh, Democratic party. Those types of social changes and economic changes, that's not going away. That's gonna continue moving those directions. And so it's hard to see uh, real change coming uh, if, if that's the currents that are underway. Um, having said that, I always have hope uh, uh, for sort of generational change. Uh, and we see it all, a little bit on various issues, very small issues, some larger issues, uh, whether gay marriage, um, smaller issues, uh, marijuana, right? Some sort of change of acceptance in other generations or younger generations um, as, as we say with all my friends, we will never be as uh, woke as our 19 year olds uh, currently are. So um, all is not lost, but in the short term, uh, things don't seem to be changing very much. And Paul? Um, the one point that the questioner was getting at, especially was, would there be a political upheaval and then you get, you don't have a 50-50 Senate where you get something where one side clearly dominates. Um, and the only time we've had that in this century was in 2008 with the Wall Street crisis coming at a time of great voter disaffection at the Iraq war and how long it was going. And it produced exactly what this questioner was, is talking about. You ended up with a Senate that had 59 uh, members of the Democratic caucus, uh, 60 once Arlen Specht across the aisle and Al Franken was certified. You had a House of Representatives that was at 257 or 258 um, in 2009. You know, there was a public there that really was a, a 
were, you know, just re repulsed by what had happened in the previous three or four years. And you had a result where, you know, Democrats won Senate races in uh, Alaska. Um, the, the, the incumbent Democratic senator in Arkansas, Mark Pryor, did not even face a Republican opponent in 2008. Um, and one thing we really haven't touched on is media. And it's, we forget now, our memories are so short that um, in 2008, we lived in a world in which Tucker Carlson had a primetime show on MSNBC. He, the spring of 2008 was when he left MSNBC, but he had spent 2005, six, seven, and early 08 at MSNBC. Sean Hannity still felt a need to have a kind of weak Democrat, Alan Combs, on his show. Um, it, it, the, you know, we didn't have this, the, the polarization within the media and what has happened there as a big driver in all of this. And I, I don't know what the next generation, this up and coming rising generation, what they're going to do, whether they're even going to really consume this type of news, whether they're going to be skipping cable altogether, whether they're going to be getting everything on their phones and through uh, some version of Snapchat uh, in that type of Instagram story news. I, I don't know. I think that will go a long way to figuring out, you know, where, where this country goes and, you know, is it, you know, a, a a place in which everybody, every communications director for a member of Congress wakes up in the morning thinking, I need to get my press release op-ed landing at some partisan right-wing, left-wing site that will launch it so that by the afternoon, uh, Politico Playbook PM is highlighting it. And then by the late afternoon, I'm on the Sean Hannity radio show, and then I'm getting booked on the, you know, the Tucker Carlson show at eight o'clock at night on primetime Fox. Like if that environment continues to be the dominant thread, then boy, it's, it's going to be a long, hard slog. Well, as they say on that note, Al Sender, Sarah Binder, Paul Kane, um, thank you very much on behalf of Sally Katzen, my co-director and myself. And Sally, you might want to have a few closing words here, but for my part, I want to thank you very much. And um, uh, and why you really appreciated uh, your participation in this. The law school is very committed to these programs, and we could not have had a better lineup of people uh, to participate and speak to these issues. Sally? I want to add my thanks uh, to Yamish and Sarah and Paul uh, as well. It was a, a thought provoking, uh, if not wholly optimistic, at least. Uh, you uh, gave us some small rays of hope, I think, along the way. I also want to thank Senator Klobuchar for her opening comments, which I thought were just terrific. And I want to thank all of the audience uh, for joining us today. Like all NYU colloquiums, this will be posted online. It will take several days to uh, make sure the transcription is correct but you will then be able to find if you uh, were distracted at some point or uh, joined us late or uh, had to leave early, it will be posted on the NYU website. Again, uh, Bob and I are so glad that you chose to join us today. Uh, have a good rest of the evening. Goodbye. Good night.